what I'm going to do with this setup, what I've done the last two, two years is went over uh, basically how to get a, a setup to be good and stable from scratch. Uh, since we've touched on that for two years now, uh, what I'm going to do is just kind of skim over it and let you see what I do uh, from start to finish as far as from the tire pressures to what I do with the chassis when I first sit down at the very first of the week and say, okay, I need to start making something for as I'm at right now at Texas. I'm going to bring the Texas uh, starting from scratch with the uh, uh, iRacing setup, and I'll show you what I do before I even go on the track because it's just out of experience of knowing. Uh, I'm going to skim over that, but what I'm going to get into here after I kind of skim over the, the minor details of this is I want to really start talking to you about packages, uh, how to instead of how to coil bind one spring or what to coil bind when or with this A car that I'm here now, uh, instead of coil binding how to ride the bump stops, how to get the springs to compress and get onto the bump stops to get that splitter on the ground, uh, I want to start talking about how to use all four springs together uh, as, a, as a package, how all four will work the front end and the back end of the car to keep it sealed off to the track as much as possible throughout the racetrack. So we'll skim over a little bit of the the basic setup stuff and then I'll get into a little bit of the packaging. Now when I'm going to get into uh, a setup, I'm right here with whatever iRacing has given us. First thing I'm going to find, I'm going to start winding up doing is, is looking at these tire pressures and I'm going to find out what my my max left right side tire pressure is, which is as you can see on the left side are 47s. Okay. I'm going to usually wind up come down a couple. I'm going to bring those left sides up about 45, and until iRacing decides to make your tire pressures actually work with the tire temperatures, there's not a whole lot you can do as far as looking at your center temps to set your pressures like we used to in 2K3. Uh, right now, it's just, it, it doesn't work. You can bring those tire pressures down to zero, and you're still going to have 20 degrees hotter in the center of the tires. So it's just it's just part of it right now, but with the uh, fixed set, I'm usually going to come up to within about two pounds or so of max on my left side tire pressures, just to start off with. Now that may change when I get to fine tuning, but to start off with, I'm going to go right there, and nine times out of ten, I'm going to give it a five to ten degree or a ten pound spread. I'll usually start out with a five pound spread. Now, when you're doing this, remember that your tire pressures are many springs. So just the way you would make a spring split on your rear springs is the same thing you're doing with your split on your tire pressures. The more split you have on your tire pressures, the more the car is going to want to turn left. Same thing with your spring split on the rear. So it's just a mini adjustment for your springs. So I'm gonna, I'll usually start out with a five pound spread and somewhere within a couple of pounds of max on the left sides, I may go up or down with that as I fine tune the thing. Then I'm gonna run over to the chassis part and you'll see here, now my chassis, uh, my chassis setup has got a 569 on the left and a 566 on the right. And this is just a, uh, an actual quirk of mine. I like mine to be even. I know guys that'll run it a little bit off one way or the other. I, I just will not run my left sides higher. Just out of common, just for me, common sense. When you're going into a corner turning left, and you're already lower on the right side, then you're just picking up the left side up off the racetrack. Because the whole purpose of getting this thing to be fast everywhere on the racetrack is to seal off the side rails, the front splitter. That's the whole purpose. Remember when you're seeing ride heights, if you work on telemetry, you'll notice a lot of the workbooks on telemetry, like what we have right up or right up here, where it's at ride heights right here. You'll, yeah, I know you guys can't see it, but right up here it'll say ride height front left, ride height front right, ride height front center. And then you've got the rear left and rear right. What that is, is where they measure these ride heights is your front center is the very center of the front splitter. That's getting the front splitter on the ground. The, the other, the front left and front right 
are measured to the side rails right behind the front tire. So getting those side rails sealed off along with that front splitter is where that side bike comes in. When you go into the corner and it just squats and all of a sudden it's not doing this number, it's just moving through the corner at a, like, a, like it's on a rail, that's sealing off those, front, those uh, side rails. The rear is measured right in front of the rear tire to the side rail. So that also has something to do with that side bike. So, and, but that is going to be higher because of the squat you'll get in the rear end going into the corners from just gravity. But like I said, we've got the tire pressure set up. First thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to start working on getting my ride heights about where I want them and start working on these front springs as to being at Texas and running Texas for a while. I know nine times out of ten what I'm going to do to this car is I'm going to put this front right spring to a 350 is where I will start out with. As soon as I change it to a 350, I'm going to go to that, that front right spring perch and bring that front right height back up to where it was. Okay? Now I'm back to where I started from with a 350 right front spring. Now I'm going to start out here just at a 425, it's just from experience and it's just getting in here and knowing about how much travel I need in the car. I'm going to start out at a 425 and I'm going to bring the front ride height back down on the left side to where it was or right there close to it. So now I'm sitting with a 425 left front, a 350 right front. Now I'm going to Look at the, if you'll notice the difference, a lot of the difference between the A car and the B car is the size of the rear springs. This A car really likes those rear springs to be soft. It likes that rear end to squat. Uh, uh, there's a lot of times I've seen the, some of the guys that, that I work with will run a 100 pound spread on that rear spring, somewhere between a 350 and a 450 or a 250 and a 350 on the rear springs. Just so, especially on the speed tracks like this, so that when the thing gets on the straightaways, that rear end just disappears and it, it's gone. There's a lot of speed in that. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the rear springs where they're at just because I wanna know what it feels like when I get out on the racetrack. All right, so I'm gonna leave that at a 450 and a 600 just because it, they're low enough to start with and it's a, it's a good place just to start from there, but I'm going to make those front ride heights where I need them, or front springs at that 350 and that 425. And this is for Texas. Usually I'll use a 350 to start about everywhere, and I'll go somewhere between a 425 and a 500 on that left front, depending on how smooth the racetrack is. The reason why I'm at a 425 at Texas is because of those nasty little bumps in one and two and coming out of three and four. I'll put that 425, and the reason for a 425 is because it allows for less travel. A 425 will not travel as far as a 450. If you'll think of, if you'll think of the, the springs as not being pounds but being height, it says 425 pounds. But 425 pound spring being this tall, for example, makes a 450 pound spring this tall. So naturally, a 450-pound spring will travel from there to here when it coal binds. A 425-pound spring will only travel from here to here when it coal binds. So when it's sitting on the bump stop or coal binding, depending on the A car or the B car, the smaller that, string, that spring is, the less it's going to travel before it stops traveling. Okay, so that's on a bumpier track, you're going to usually want something that travels less and get that spring to get the front splitter to sit on the track to where it doesn't move. And when that bump, it's going to, the thing's going to drive like a bucking bronco. I mean, it will, it'll drive rough. But the rougher that thing's driving, the usually the less that front splitter's moving. So that's where you're getting your speed from is because that splitter's not coming up off the ground anywhere on the racetrack. If you can keep that thing planted everywhere on the track, you're going to be faster just out of speed, not even, not even counting handling. So getting that thing to where it travels less. Now, most of the time, I'm gonna, I'll start with this A car. With these bump stops, 
I'm going to put both of them at the same thing to start with just to start the race off with or just to start the setup off with. And I like starting with a three. Why? Pick Dale Earnhardt's number. Just there's no reason really. <laughs> it's just the number I like to start with because I start working around it. But I'll usually start with no packers and a three on the bump stop just to go out there and start feeling what it does on the racetrack. Once I get out on the racetrack, if I'm not hitting the splitters too much with this, then I'll know which way I need to go with the packers or the bump stops. Remember the bump stops, the bump stops themselves, the numbers for the bump stops is how, how many, some people say how many bump stops you have, or some people will say how thick the bump stop is. I usually like to think of it as being just thicker, just in my head, the picture in my head makes it better. So a, a one bump stop will only be, say, this thick. A three bump stop will, say, be three times as thick. So it'd be a little taller bump stop. So the more rubber you have on that bump stop, the harder it's going to be to compress. So a taller bump stop is going to make the spring, when it coils bound on top of it, going to make it stop just a little sooner. Now your packers is where your bump stop is actually located. So your packers will actually, you've got a three bump stop, You've got your packers right here. Now, if you want to add another packer, it slides that, that same amount of bump stop up higher. Add another packer, it'll slide that bump stop up a little higher. So now when the spring comp compresses, it still has the same amount of give, but it actually gets to it quicker. So there's where you can fine tune where that splitter, if you're going into the one and it's just perfect and you hit that dip in three and four in Texas, and that thing, you hear that front splitter scrape, slide that bump stop up just a hair. And see if it don't, when you hit that dip, scrape less and make it upset the car less. That's where you'll get that little bit of, that little bit of handling through those bumps. It's how you position the bump stop and how thick the bump stop is. And now this is just all part of getting, before I've even gone on the racetrack. Now the shocks for, oh, one thing I'll do right quick, the casters. My casters, nine times out of 10, I'll start with a five on the left and a six on the right. That, not, that will change, I can pretty much bet you. When it gets down to the last thing I'm doing to the car to get the right amount of rotation through the whole corner, I will change those, those casters a little bit because the higher that left side caster, the more the car's wanna, gonna wanna rotate through the center. So you're, asking, you're thinking now, okay, well, why don't we just run it all the way up? Well, then you're tearing up tires all to pieces. So you need to you balance that caster out to where it's not leaning the, the tire forward too much, but it's leaning it enough and you've got enough uh, adjustment to it to where the car will naturally rotate by itself with the casters with the, because the right front leaning forward a little further than the left front it's naturally going to want to turn the corner a little better. So finding that balance between the two is something you'll probably, one of the last things you'll do before, okay, this thing's ready to race, is getting those casters set to work. That and also the feel of the car. It, a lot of people like a heavier steering wheel. How the steering wheel is a little stiffer through the corners. The higher that caster is, the more heavier that steering wheel feel. That has a lot to do with where my casters will sit. A lot of times I like my steering wheel to be a little lighter. So I'll go to a four five 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 four five five split to where it'll give me that feeling I like in my steering wheel and still give me the rotation I'm looking for. All right. Now, once we've got this set, the one of the things I'm going to do just before I go out is I'm going to make sure that my ride heights are about where I want them to be. And that's going to be, I can do that with cambers. See, right now I'm sitting at a 66 across the nose, a 99 left and a 98 right, which is okay for me right now, just starting out, because I'm going to want those rears to be up. And the reason why I'm sitting at a 66, because everything you're looking at here is static numbers, sitting on pit road. If you're ever watching NASCAR and you see them do those low camera angles, when they're running the camera in between the cars and you can see just right as they're making that nice low shot, you'll see the splitter sitting up about this high off the racetrack. Well, that's what this is. 
But when they get out there on the racetrack and they show that car coming down the back straightaway and all of a sudden that, sp that splitter's sealed off on that pavement, that's what's going to happen to this car when it goes out. That's the reason why you have to match the front, the front ride heights with how much travel you have in these front springs so that when these front springs get to that bump stop and stop traveling, that front ride height is at the point to where it's sitting right on the racetrack. There's the part of, part of the package that I'm going to talk to you about is getting three things on the front end. Your front preload right here. Your front ride heights right here. And the amount of travel in your front springs. All right, now how do you find out how much travel you have in your front springs? That is in your spring deflections right here. This spring will travel 4.57 inches. Sitting on pit road, it's already traveled 3.04 inches on the right front. 3.04 from 4.57 is what, just a little less than an inch and a half or right at an inch and a half? So you've got an inch and a half of travel left in that right front spring. Your left front spring has almost two inches of travel in it. So that left front spring is going to travel a little further than the right front spring will into the corners when, the, when it sits down. So that's how you know how much travel you have in those springs. So if you want to coil bind these things, what this is known right here is what I would call this is a right front coil bound, but it's not actually coil bound because you're hitting the bump stops. But it's still, a, the, the right front's going to stop traveling before the left front. So it's basically the same thing. It's a right front coil bound. All right. And to make this a, a left front coil bound, you would just bring this, front, this left front spring down to a 375. And then when you reset your ride heights, back to the 66 that it was or close to it now you're 283 of 457 see now you have left travel so now that left front's going to coal bound quicker so that basically having your preload your front ride heights and the amount of travel in your front springs that in combination is what's going to give you the amount of travel you have from sitting still to sealing off the front end so those are the three things you need to work on to get that front splitter sealed off. Now, I, just to give you a basic idea of what I want you to picture in your head as far as front preload, if you'll think of that negative front preload as a winch, and the more negative preload you've got, the more you're winching down on those springs, okay? So the less room those springs will have to travel. All right, the more negative preload in there, the less movement that front end will have. And to me, is a good thing. The less it moves, the less room it has to move and get. When you go out on the straightaway and that air starts pushing down on that back end, that front end's got to come up. Well, the less you allow that to happen, the more you stay on the ground in the straightaways, the more speed you're going to have down the straightaway. So the more that rear end gets down and it squats the whole car and not does this, then the more speed you'll have on straightaways because having that splitter stay a little bit more in the air and have that or the have the front splitter stay on the ground and the rear spoiler stay a little bit higher in the air will always give you more speed than having that that rear spoiler just totally disappear and that front splitter come up because now you're just acting like a parachute that wind's hitting up underneath that front end and it's just pushing you backwards it's a whole lot better to have that wind come and push that nose down and then skim over the top and catch a little spoiler than it is to get up underneath and just push up against the front end of the car. So the, putting that splitter to me, and it's, it may be just my personal opinion, but to me that front splitter is the most important part of the race car, beat car, truck, or A. Getting that front splitter on the ground all the time is the most important part of finding handling and speed. Okay, no, just don't even worry so much about where that rear spoiler is as compared to where that front splitter is. All right, now, the three things of getting that splitter is how much negative preload you have as compared to how much ride height you have as to how much travel you have in the front springs. And the only way to do that is to go out on the racetrack. If you're hitting the front end, you've got one of two things. Your front ride heights are too low to start with or you've got too much travel in the front springs. That's basically it. You, your, your 
preload is going to you'll you'll work on that as you go but your preload's not going to make that big a difference that you're just banging that nose you can't take enough preload out or add enough preload to it to bring the nose where it needs to be without changing these front springs and these front ride heights so anytime you're hit just banging the splitter off the ground and it's making picking the nose up and making the i know you guys have been out there and all of a sudden bam 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 and you start sliding up the track that's too little ride height, too much travel in the front spring. So you need to shorten those springs or bring the ride heights up, one or two. And you know you can only plumb the ride heights up to, what, a 599, I think it is, on the front ride heights. It's as high as you can go. So if you've got so much travel that having those front ride heights set all the way high and it's still banging the splitter, then you know it's the front springs. But usually, nine times out of 10, I'm gonna be, depending on the racetrack, if I'm running at Charlotte, uh, my ride heights are going to be mid, low to mid 50s, five and a half. If I can get it down to a 550, 551 at a place like Charlotte because it's so smooth, then I'll set it down right on the racetrack the whole time. But if I have to, I'll, I'll bring it up in between a 555 and a 560 to give it that little extra room to travel so when it gets on the straightaway, it'll squat. So, but on a bumpier track like Texas, uh, can, uh, Kentucky, places like that, I'm usually going to give it a little bit more front ride height. So just to give it some room to get over the bumps. So that is basically what I'm going to do to start the race, the, the car out. Uh, now, the only thing I would do now is just go out and run it, which I'm not going to do in here because this thing throws me out of the seat. Uh, the, basically what, I'm gonna, what happens now is just go out and run it, see if it bangs the racetrack. So when you've got it to that point, then you can start tweaking these front springs to see where you're at. So now everybody, um, I've talked about it a lot about getting your cambers set, getting the cambers on the right, on the right front about 10 degrees across uh, between five and 10, I usually like. The left front I have a little bit more leeway with. I'll usually try to get it in that 10 degree range, but if I'm 15 degrees and the car's just running like a, you know, running like a scalded dog, then I'm not going to worry about that too much as long as I'm not doing too much tire wear on the left front. But other than that, you know, getting those cambers right. Now, when you change your springs, remember to check your cambers again because a different spring rate will give you a different rollover on your tire. A smaller spring that stiffens up quicker will allow less roll in that left front tire or that right front tire to where it may be over cambered now. You may have to adjust those cambers a little bit as you go. So that's basically as far as the setup now with the A car to as far as using this as a package now. And I sure wish iRacing would do a whole lot better job with these shocks because the only way to really tie the, in the A car the 032 shocks is just really, you don't have a whole lot of, a lot of options there. Uh, I would love to have some, some shock absorbers in these things, but they're just in the A car. The only way to get that thing to sit down on those bump stops as heavy as this car is, as much power as it has, is, is to run those 032s to tie that front end down. So there's not a whole lot you can do with that. Uh, I have found out that running a 32-32 on that right rear will stable the car on entry. I don't know if a lot of y'all have had the same problem that I had, especially when I first started coming from the B car as much as I run to the A car. I had a lot of trouble being able to control the A car on entry. It seemed like every time I'd want to go in, the thing would just want to turn to the infield. I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't figure out why the A car wanted to turn in so sharp. Well, once I brought that rear rebound all the way up, it smoothed that entry right out. It just, every time I'd go in now, the car would give that natural left turn, smooth as silk through the, through the entry of the corner to the center. And all I'd done was just bring the rebound all the way up. Is it, is, um, try, try turning it on. How's that? There you go. I thought this would be a good, good place to kind of stop for a second and see if there's any questions maybe. Absolutely. Uh, thus far i know he's covered some great material but any questions so far and i think also to kind of let you know where we're going in the next session we're going to introduce the telemetry mm -hmm. and show you how we look at those numbers on on the uh on motec 
so save those questions for a little bit later. So when he and he and Ray get in here, we're going to look at um, at some of those things up on the other screen. So with that thought, any questions maybe uh, for him right now? Yes, sir. If you only have an inch of def spring deflection left in your setup, but your ride heights are five five and a half inches, for instance. How does that get down to the track? Okay, well see, what you're looking at as far as the ride heights are uh, on the start, that five and a half inches, what that is is just NASCAR rules. That's just what they have to be on rules. It's going to travel the, the whole way down to the racetrack. It's just those are the NASCAR rules. It can't, be, it can't start out on pit road being less than five and a half inches, okay? Now, don't get so deep into it that you have to start figuring out exactly every number. Because remember, it's still a sim. It's not real life. So it's not going to be totally exact. What you've got to do now is just transfer what it does here to what it does for you out on the racetrack. So don't overthink it. Randy. Do you by chance know where the ride heights are measured from? Because in running the Indy car, which is what I do, the ride heights are not measured from the lowest point of the chassis, but it's measured somewhere up from that. So many times we'll be running negative uh, uh, and still not hitting the ground. So that that might answer some of his question, but the question is, do you know where it's measured from? Now on the oval car, now the Indy car, I don't, I have no clue. The only ones I've studied are the oval cars. Uh, you know, some of the the, in, the road course guys would be a whole lot better to ask than I would be for that. But as far as the uh, measurements for ride heights, uh, what you're seeing on the front here is, now I know on telemetry, it's uh, center of the front splitter, behind the front tire, on both sides of the side rail, and in front of the rear tire, both sides of the side rail. So that gives you that little bit of lift you see from on the side rails above the racetrack. That's where the measurements are taken. The, when you see your rear ride heights, it's not your rear spoiler. It's your rear side rail in front of the rear tires, which, of course, is going to bring the spoiler in the air. But that's not where the measurement is going. So, Because you know the cars are not two inches you know, apart from, uh, from your front splitter to your rear spoiler. That's not just two inches. But from your front side rail to your rear side rail is two inches. That's good, good. Yes, sir. Let me get the mic to you. Uh, I can talk for you. You got your good base baseline here. Mm -hmm. What what's your gauge on how much you're going to adjust? Say you go out on the track, you run what three laps or four laps, and then you come in and change it. What kind of you know? What are you going to go up? Fifteen points, thirty points? You, you get my question? Oh, as far as how much of adjustment? Right. When you come back in and you're gonna you're gonna adjust it. What do you have a gauge about how much you're going to try? Yeah, it's going to be very slight because if you start making huge changes, you have no idea what just what it just affected. So going from a uh, a three a three seventy five left front spring to a five hundred left front spring, you have no clue whether it, it it was the change that done it or you just went too far. So usually I'll go no more than a three seventy five to a four twenty five, just for example. That way I know if 425 is too far, I only have one click to change and go back to a 400, just split it. So my changes are very slight as far as, and it's only one corner at a time. I'll never make two changes, never. I'll make one change because if you change the left front corner and go and change the right front corner and then get your ride heights fixed and go back out on the racetrack, which corner was the one that made it better or worse? So I'll always change it, and I know it's tedious. It, it truly is. But I, and nine times out of ten, it, there's the only way of doing this is making a small change, running four or five laps, coming back. And if you can't tell by three or four laps into it, then you need to make a little bit more changes because it shouldn't take you more than two or three laps. Yeah, I heard you say we want to get – the splitter down on the ground in the corner, but then coming out of the straightaways, common sense tells me as soon as you get on the gas, torque's going to raise the front end. Exactly you said you right. wanted to squat. Right. I didn't hear how you would make it squat. Good question. That's exactly where I'm going right now. So what, what we're doing with that, with the A car, 
and it works this translates to the B car and everything you just have to do it a little bit differently but using the A car for example the what I call that is tying the front end down okay the best way to tie that front end down is to start with that left front corner now there are really two good ways to get that left front tied down and the reason why you want to tie that left front down is because when you go into a corner turning left and all that force of the weight is going to that right front corner naturally what's it going to do pick that left side up right so if you the more you can tie that left side down and keep it when it instead of going to the corner the car wanting to flatten out and keep the car to want to squat in the corner, the faster you're going to be through the corners, the less the front end is going to come up. Now, how do we do that? Two things. In this A car, cross weight is your friend. Uh, I, let's see. Phoenix, no. Actually, Daytona, no. Uh, Vegas has no. Uh, about about every setup that I've started building since the NIS started when I've really started getting heavy into this A car uh, moving up from the B car to do more of this A car stuff I don't think any of my cross weights have been less than 58% actually I have gotten close to 60% nose weight or cross weight on my on my A cars the reason for that is if you've already got weight on the right front then there's nowhere for weight to go when you enter the corners. If the weight's already there, when the, the natural weight transfers to that right front, if the weight's already there, there's nowhere for it to go. So the only place it can go is get to a little bit of the right front and start turning left. Okay, because I've told this at all the seminars, is to, when you're thinking about weight transfer, think of a total empty car with a flat surface. The whole car is totally empty. There's no seats, no roll cages, no steering wheel, no dash, nothing. It's just an empty shell with a flat floor. When you go into that corner and turn left, there's a marble in the center of that car. When you turn left and go into that corner, naturally that marble is going to go to that right front tire. Okay, the trick to speed through these corners is getting that marble not to go all the way to the right front tire to get it to stop as soon as possible. That's your weight. The sooner it starts traveling to the left front because the, the natural uh, inertia of the car sitting in the corner, it starts traveling the weight. The sooner you can get it to start running around the front and coming to that left front tire, the, that's that rotation you feel in the center of the corner when that car hits that pivot point. That's that weight transfer into that left front tire. So the sooner you can get, the less you can get to go to that right front, the sooner you can get it to travel to the left front, the sooner you can start getting on the throttle and that marble start rolling right back to that right rear. Well, you also don't want it to do with anything back there either. So it's going to travel across the center of the car to the right rear of the car. The sooner you can get that thing to get not, a, not as far back to the right rear as possible. But when it comes off the corner, it starts rolling right back to the center of the car. The more car, the more balanced that thing's going to seal. So the, the, the marble traveling in a smaller section of the center of the car, the, the more balanced that race car is going to be, the less wear you're going to have on the tires. So now tying down that left front with more weight on the right front, so it keeps that, that weight coming back to that left front quicker, it ties that left front down. So that right there, that and arm symmetry will tie that left front down to keep that splitter on the, on the ground. What's very interesting is uh, we'll show you in the next session if we get to it. The a, marbles. Uh, yeah. The marbles in the telemetry actually show you that little circle that he's talking about. Mm -hmm.